back here on Latter-day Radio on 1430 KLO World Class Talk. And we have a repeat guest. By popular demand, Hannah Stoddard is back with us. If you listened to her last week, she and her family run the Joseph Smith Foundation. They have a couple of different websites, josephsmithfoundation.org and ldsanswers.org. ldsanswers.org. You have a question. She has the answer. Is that what you're telling us, Hannah? No, the, the Lord has the answers and the scriptures have the answers and we're all on the journey together. So. And she's done her homework and put it in an easy to read format. And today mm-hmm. we're going to put it in an easy to hear format here on the radio. There you go. Perfect. So last week we talked about affirming our faith through study and finding answers because they're out there for us. And we're coming up on the July 4th holiday next mm-hmm. week. So Hannah, what can we learn about the Book of Mormon, about America's destiny and the importance of personal freedom? Mm-hmm. It's absolutely, it's one, of the, it's one of the most important themes in the Book of Mormon. You know, the Joseph Smith Foundation has produced um, six high budget documentaries and two of those documentaries were on the Book of Mormon and how the history of the Book of Mormon is actually a prophetic parallel of our time. And, you know, uh, I, I want everybody listening just to think with me, you know, if you if you went through the government school system and or took history classes, probably a lot of you, except for a few of the history buffs, were probably bored out of your mind and thought, oh, man, history, it's just dates and facts. Why does this matter? What does it have to do with real life? And I think one of the reasons why history has um, turned into that for so many um, of our young people is that we've taken God out of the history. We've taken out the providential aspect, the miracles. And when you put God back in, history just becomes absolutely incredible, amazing, fascinating, um, exciting. Um, And one specific example, if we want to talk here about America with the 4th of July coming up, um, one of my favorite stories, which happens to center right on Independence Day, that holiday, is the story of the reconciliation between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Oh, yeah. I love that story. So You know that story. And they died on the same day, which is really an amazing story. You're giving spoilers. You're giving spoilers, Oh, I'm sorry. (laughs) <laughs> no, that's awesome. Yes. So so some of the miracle behind that is you had John Adams, Thomas Jefferson. They were both on the committee for drafting the Declaration of Independence. Best friends. They called each other brothers. They loved each other. They were um, they had a good dynamic of working together. But then as um, you know, each had a term as a president of the United States, they became bitter enemies just through the whole political process. And, and they finally, they, w- they weren't even talking to each other. Well, one day, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, his name was Benjamin Rush, he had a dream. And in this dream, he, um, he, he saw a man holding this history book of the future, um, this history book of the United States. And, and, and as he was reading this history book, um, he read that in the, in the future, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were going to be reconciled together and that they were going to write these letters back and forth with each other and that they were going to die um, very close to the same time. So Benjamin Rush wakes up and, of course, at the time where, when he has this dream, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson are not friends. They're not writing letters. They hate each other. And so he writes a letter to John Adams and he says, you know, John Adams, you, you got you to gotta write this letter. And, um, and he writes to John, Thomas Jefferson, you got to reconcile with John Adams. Well, they end up reconciling. They end up writing all these letters back and forth. Well, in Benjamin Rush's dream, um, this prophecy of the future, it said that these letters were going to hold truths that were very important. So we can ask ourselves now, looking back, looking back in hindsight, what what were in these letters that were so powerful? Now you want me to... You made me want to read Benjamin Rush's letters. Yes, yes, no, no, definitely. They're they're fascinating. They're they're so exciting. So here's Thomas Jefferson and John Adams writing back and forth. Now they, you know, kind of their end of the end of the they're at the end of their lives. They've um they've they fought the war for independence. They've been engaged in bringing America, founding America, and um and they talked about a lot about doctrines in Christianity and in religion that they felt had moved away from the original 
truth that was revealed by Jesus Christ. In other words, they essentially said, Thomas Jefferson said, we're in a stage of apostasy and a restoration of truth needs to happen. So for example, um, John Adams talked about grace alone, this idea that, you know, you're saved regardless of your works in this life. You say a prayer, you're saved, you go to heaven. He said, that is ridiculous. Thomas Jefferson said, you know, I, I think... <laughs> The guys who came up with that idea were atheists. He says, that's not the guy that I know. That's not that's not the God that I worship um, would, it would not have that kind of, that's not a true principle. Um, they both talked about uh, priestcraft and how they didn't understand this idea of the Trinity. They said, it just doesn't make sense. This three in one God, this essence, this power. Thomas Jefferson said, there's no way. He said, I go out into nature and this universe is clearly governed by a providential God. Um, this God that's been created by this evangelical world is not true. Now, this created a lot of, this gave Thomas Jefferson a lot of enemies in the evangelical world. In fact, a lot, there will, there will be some Christians even today who say that Thomas Jefferson, he was anti-Christian. He, he was not a Christian. He was just a deist and yeah, right. didn't, didn't believe in God and Jesus. And a lot of that is because he was criticizing some of these ideas that were, that we understand from the perspective of Joseph Smith and from the restoration. Yes, he was right. He was concerned about things that were, had become errors in in Christianity and in religion. And it's interesting because jo Thomas Jefferson, he had a statement where he said, I hold the precepts of Jesus as delivered by himself to th be the most pure, benevolent, and sublime which have ever been preached to man. And he said, I adhere to the principles of the first age. In other words, he said, I, I believe what Jesus Christ was teaching. Whatever was the original primitive church, that's the Christianity I hold to. And he said, Freedom, he said, I've helped establish freedom of religion in America. If we can keep freedom of religion in America, he said, I believe a restoration will occur. Truth will rise to the surface. Error will fall away. Now, do you have a date on that letter? Yes. Yeah, so get this. So he said that this reformation was going to advance, but he said, it's going to be too late for me to witness. And he made that statement in November 1820. Wow. What was going on in upstate New York? Just... <laughs> Just nearby. Hop, skip, and a jump away yeah. from Virginia. Joseph Smith had had the first <clears> vision. <throat> Here he is studying. He's getting ready to very, in a couple of years, Angel Moroni is going to be appearing. And the Book of Mormon is going to be coming forth. And here's Thomas Jefferson in 1820 feeling this restoration is going to occur. It's going to be too late for me to witness it, but it is going to occur. And so the interesting thing is, so here they are in 1820 writing back and forth. Um, there's also a letter where John Adams' wife, Abigail, died, which was just a tragedy for him. Um, and, and Thomas Jefferson writes a letter to him of comfort saying, you know, I've lost my wife too. I lost Martha. But remember the truth that we know that we will be together with our wives after this life. We will be together. We will see them again. Take comfort in that be, don't, don't, don't get discouraged. Don't get downhearted. Remember that truth. And he said, you know, I've, I've searched the Bible. I don't, I, I don't know where it is, but I feel in my heart that this is a truth from God. And of course we know that Joseph Smith later revealed that, restored that truth. So here are these founding fathers, these men who brought forth the constitution of the United States, then these men who brought forth freedom to us today. And they were looking forward to this restoration and they were inspired. So Benjamin Rush said that they died about the same day. And we know that they both died on July 4th. Um, and so... If, 1824, right? 1826. 1826. So, yep. Just before, the, just before the church was restored four years very later. Soon. Yes. So Joseph Smith is working on getting the Book of Mormon right about this time. So here's John Adams, Thomas Jefferson. They actually died within three hours of each other. Now, the fascinating thing is that the, when they died, July 4th, 1826 was actually the 50th year jubilee of the signing of the Declaration of Independence on July 4th, 1776. Now, sometimes in our modern world, we don't understand number symbolism. So let's talk about the number symbolism. So the number 50 is symbolic because it has seven sets of seven. So seven in Hebrew, um, in Hebrew symbolism is a symbol of perfection. And when you have seven sets of seven, then you have, and then the following year is what was called in Jubilee times, uh, Hebrew times, the Jubilee year. And it was a time of rejoicing. It was a time of liberty. They would free all the slaves. They would let their land, the land lie unused. Um, in fact, the Liberty Bell 
is inscribed with Leviticus 25 when the verse says, proclaim liberty throughout the land to all the inhabitants. That verse is actually about the Jubilee year. Wow. So, so the Jubilee year was an important theme in American history. So I don't, maybe, maybe you can say it's just coincidence. Maybe it's just an accident, but maybe not that John Adams and Thomas Jefferson both died on the same day on the 50th Jubilee year. I'm going to teach you a little German. Yes. We would tell this to our uh, YSA students when we were in Germany. And this is a quote attributable to Albert Einstein. And he said, Der Zufall ist wie Gott anonym bleibt. Which means, coincidence is how God remains anonymous. There you go. Absolutely. Did, did, you, did you pick up that German? You've got that German phrase. There'll be a test later. Anna. Okay, let's. The, I, let me give me some time to prep on that. <laughs> okay, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> we'll do that. Um, absolutely, <clears throat> and I think that's how God works, right? So you can look at history and you can say, "Ah, oh, it's just coincidence." No God, or you can say, "No, this is God's hand," and um, you definitely see that with the deaths of Adams and Jefferson. Which, um, in the next segment, I'll share a little bit more about the death scene, which is very touching. Yeah, we're going to be coming up to a close in in just a couple of minutes, but. Uh, in case you just joined us, uh, this is Latter-day Radio. I'm Greg Gerard. I'm here with our wonderful guest, Hannah Stoddard. So tell us as much as you can yeah. about their final final uh, letters and final days as you can about Jefferson and Adams. Well, Jefferson and Adams, we'll talk about the death scene. It's quite an interesting um, uh, death scene. Definitely shows the miraculous hand of God. Um, and then we'll also talk a little bit about the Founding Fathers, their involvement with Freemasonry, and how that's also a tie to the American Covenant and a tie to the Restoration as a prelude to the Restoration of the Gospel. And again, as we talked about last week, Having an, under, having an understanding about God's hand in the affairs of the United States of America and in our lives, whether it's a coincidence or not, is, again, faith-affirming, don't you think? Absolutely. In fact, it's what gave me um, one of my strongest testimonies of liberty. And I can share about that in the next segment, too. Well, we hope you stay with us here. Uh, Latter-day Radio is on every Friday from 10 to 1 here on 1430 KLO world-class talk. We're going to be continuing to talk about America's birthday uh, the rest of the hour today. Uh, Hannah Stoddard is our is our guest here today. And again, Hannah, tell us your uh, website addresses. Yes, it is josephsmithfoundation.org. And you can also go to ldsanswers.org or see any of our documentaries, particularly Statesmen and Symbols, Prelude to the Restoration. Well, thank you. This is Latter-day Radio on 1430 KLO World Class Talk. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back to Latter-day Radio here on 1430 KLO World Class Talk. And I'm here again with our guest, Hannah Stoddard. She was with us last week. Last week, we talked about affirming our faith by doing our homework, and today we'd like to talk about America's destiny. So we kept uh, uh, them hanging on a cliff while <laughs> we had these announcements about John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Mm -hmm. So give us the, the end of this inspiring story about the two of them. Right. So just kind of as a recap for those that are just joining us here. So Benjamin Rush, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, he was a mutual friend of Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. He had a dream and in his dream, he saw that they were going to die almost at the same time. And um, of course, they did end up dying on the same day on July 4th, 1826, the 50th year jubilee of the July 4th, Independence Day, that we'll be celebrating here coming up soon again. And he, um, and they died within about three hours of each other. Thomas Jefferson died first um, in um, about three o'clock, I believe. So here's John Adams. He doesn't know that Thomas Jefferson has passed and, and he's on his deathbed. And, and um, one of the witnesses there said that the last words that John Adams uttered before he died was, was Thomas Jefferson survives. Now, I, I'm not going to say that I know 
exactly what that meant and why why he said that. Um, but I will say one interesting uh, similarity is that Brigham Young, when Brigham Young died, his last words were Joseph, 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 which is interesting. These people came to get him, maybe. <laughs> Possibly, yes. Definitely. And so here's John Adams and, and one of the another one of the eyewitnesses who was there said that it had been a rainstorm all day, just thunder and lightning. And at the moment that John Adams died, a thunderclap shouted, the clouds parted and sunshine came shining through. Um, one of the witnesses that there said it was this amazing moment of death and he envisioned, you know, him going back to his maker to report back um, to God and, and, and having finished his life's work. A report on a job well done. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, and so it, it, their their deaths were so significant that Eliza R. Snow Smith, who later became one of the wives of Joseph Smith, um, she actually wrote about their deaths at the time. She wrote a eulogy to them, talking about their legacy and how um, she was a strong patriot herself. She loved liberty. Um, Daniel Webster, um, he he also gave a eulogy to the deceased patriots. And the story, but the story doesn't end there. The story um, continues on into, into 1877. Wilford Woodruff is at the St. George Temple, and he has an experience where all of the signers of the Declaration of Independence come to him, including Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. And they come to him and they say, we need our temple work done. They say, <laughs> you know, Wilford Woodruff, we are the ones that gave you this land of liberty. We gave you the opportunity to have temples. We need our work done. Do our work. And so he he stayed in that temple for days and he got all of their work done. He got their baptisms done and their um, their other temple ordinances. And that's without family search. And that was without family search. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that's really, for me, kind of the culmination of the story it shows the connection between America and the American covenant with the restoration of the gospel. It's it's the, the story is tied together. And um, another way to, that you see the story connected is is with George Washington. So George Washington and Benjamin Franklin. Um, Benjamin Franklin, of course, is a signer of the Declaration of Independence. George Washington, the father of our country, as he's known as. Um, they were both very involved in Freemasonry. And now I'm only going to give just a very short introduction to this because we have an entire documentary on our website. It's called Statesmen and Symbols, Prelude to the Restoration, where you can get all the details. And it's an amazing, incredible story. You don't want to give it away for free. Well, I, I wish I wish I could. I'll give as much as I can on the radio, but I wouldn't want to bore our listeners too long. It's an hour and a half documentary, so it's packed. Um, but so it's a trailer. You're giving us a trailer, mm -hmm. an audio trailer. Okay, that's, that's fine. That's right. So um, Benjamin Franklin, he's actually the one that's kind of credited with bringing Freemasonry to America. George Washington was a Freemason. And a lot of people ask, you know, what's the deal with this? Why we? Why was there this interest um, that they had? Well, we know that Joseph Smith was also a Freemason, um, and we go into the full history of that. And what you discover is that the same symbols that George Washington and Benjamin Franklin were drawn to, the same symbols, um, some of the same ideas, were ideas and symbols that Joseph Smith ended up restoring as part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But those very same symbols are found in ancient China. They're actually found in Egypt, ancient Britain, uh, Mesopotamia, among the early Christians. And I always like to ask people, you know, who say, well, Joseph Smith just made this whole thing up. You know, he just plagiarized the whole thing. I go, okay, how did he know? We're just studying now. We're just discovering right now within the last decade, these symbols among the early Christians, among Buddha, among in China. How did Joseph Smith know? And I would submit that it was based on inspiration, that this is, he was restoring symbols that stretch back all the way back to Adam and to Enoch and to Melchizedek. And that's why Joseph Smith felt this draw to them. And that's why the founding fathers felt this draw as well. It was a restoration of all things, just as the prophets prophesied in the Bible. Well, he didn't have the internet. He couldn't ask Google. That's right. He had no outside uh, mm -hmm. research available to him. So I guess we're just going to have to admit that he had revelation mm -hmm. and inspiration. In case you just joined us, I'm... I'm Greg Gerard, and I'm here with Hannah Stoddard with uh, the Joseph Smith Foundation, and you're listening to Latter-day Radio. So tell us more, please, Hannah, about the Lord's hand in the establishment of this country. Yeah. Well, it's something I think a lot of times 
um, people, you know, we were, we've been talking about the founding miracles in the lives of the founding fathers. We've been talking about um, their involvement with Freemasonry and how they acted really as a prelude to the restoration. And I think that's something that a lot of times when we get into history, we don't need to be embarrassed of these things. We don't need to feel, oh, did Joseph, you know, is this an issue? Because when you study it out, you actually realize that it's faith promoting. In fact, um, I've had a lot of couples actually use the Statesman and Symbols documentary that we produced as to help their children get ready for temple prep as they're going through the temple for the first time. Use this documentary, watch it. Um, I know I've had several young men and women come up to me and say, it made the temple so exciting because then when I went through, I saw, I felt like, wow, this is something that I feel connected to, you know, the patriarchs, to um, early Christians, to the founding fathers. This is, this is a theme of the gospel that's gone back through from the very beginning of history. That's what happens when we're disconnected from our history. Yes. We aren't able to put it in context and say, oh, well, that explains why we do what we do today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's like what Hugh Nibley said once at a, at a commencement at, at BYU. Mm-hmm. He says, well, here we are dressed in the robes of a false priesthood yes. as they all have their caps and gowns on. <laughs> so... Uh, That's why history is important, right? Right. Absolutely. And what you discover when you study history, um, American history, is that the founding fathers, they prepared the land for the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they didn't just prepare it by giving us a government of liberty, but they prepared the sacred symbols. They prepared the culture. They helped the people become prepared, their hearts and their minds, so that when Joseph Smith arrived on the scene, they were ready and that the field was white, ready to harvest. And one of the fascinating things is moving into the Book of Mormon, which the Book of Mormon is actually what gave me my love of liberty. Um, And I'll share one detail before I I share my story. But George Washington, interestingly enough, made several statements throughout his life that are very similar to wording used by Captain Moroni. So, for example, um, one time there were George Washington in a letter. He wrote that we have taken up arms in defense of our liberty, our property, our wives and our children. Now, if you read the Book of Mormon, you read Alma you're saying, wait a minute, that sounds really familiar. That sounds suspiciously like Captain Moroni when Captain Moroni said that he was preparing to support their liberty, their lands, their wives, and their children, the title of liberty. Um, George Washington and Congress and, and other founding fathers used the phrase, the standard of liberty. Of course, that's the same phrase used by right. Captain Moroni. Um, and when you study, there's so many other similarities, so much so that some critics of the church have said, you know what, I think Joseph Smith just plagiarized Captain Moroni from George Washington. He just studied American history and copied it over. That's that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is, no, this is, it's the same cause. It's the same inspiration. And so you see the same words, the same battle strategies, the same inspiration, the same loyalty. When you even study the genealogy and the scattering and the gathering of Israel, you realize it's really the same family. It's the same, um, the same blood, the same heritage that's continuing on from both the Book of Mormon time period to the restoration of the gospel. And the founding fathers were a big part of that. Well, it's certainly an inspiration to dove into these things. I have in my car, since I knew I was going to come here to visit you, a, a book that I got as a gift a while ago, and it's about it's about three inches thick. It's called Sacred Fire, oh, yes. and it's yes. uh, the story of George Washington and his uh, these coincidences that we talked yeah. about, quote unquote, <laughs> quote unquote, uh, where the Lord obviously prepared him for a, a sacred mission as the as the man we have on our one dollar bill. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, What more can you tell us about how these people and these men and these concepts prepared prepared us for the restoration? Yes. Well, I'd like to talk for just a second about um, the Book of Mormon and um, and how. So when I grew up, my dad, um, he, he, he's been a lover of liberty um, since before I was born. He would, he would do different breakfasts on the 4th of July for our ward and tell the stories and um, study George Washington and study the 5,000-year leap, Cleon Skousen, and all of that. And, you know, but when I was growing up, I didn't understand why the Constitution was important. 
Why is rule of law important? Why a democracy versus, you know, a republic? Uh, what checks and balances? Why does this really matter? I didn't understand it. And, you know, picketing at the Capitol legislation just seemed really boring. And I just didn't understand it. I thought, you know, that's not really my cause. Um, until I was about 16, 17 years old. And I had an experience by studying the Book of Mormon where I realized that the cause of Christians is the cause of liberty. And oh, yeah, that's the great. Book of Mormon is a key to helping our youth. And we'll talk about that more in the next segment. Well, well certainly, uh, religion is still under attack everywhere. We spent uh, three months last year uh, doing a special mission uh, at the UN to teach people about human rights. And if we aren't free to express ourselves, if we aren't free to it, freely assemble together, yeah. certainly uh, religious freedom is at risk. Religious freedom is the cause of our time. You don't want to go anywhere. This is Latter-day Radio on 1430 KLO World Class Talk. We'll be back after these messages. Before we go, here's a quick reminder. In case you missed part of today's show, you should be able to hear it again as a podcast. Generally within five working days of the broadcast, you can download the whole program. Just go to kloradio.com or visit us at latterdayradio.com and leave us a note. Okay, we're back here on Latter Day Radio on 1430 KLO World Class Talk. I'm Greg Gerard. Our guest today to help us celebrate the upcoming 4th of July holiday is Hannah Stoddard. She's not very old, but she has a lot of good information at her fingertips, having been raised on on these subjects about the Book of Mormon and freedom since she was just a wee a wee lass. A wee lass. <laughs> so so Hannah, you're going to tell us today about the forgotten founding fathers. Who have we forgotten and what have we forgotten about them? Mm-hmm. Well, let's let's start with the Book of Mormon. Not saying that they are the um uh, but the Book of Mormon kind of gives us a hint into who these forgotten founding fathers are. The Book of Mormon is actually the tool that gave me my love of liberty and freedom um, because I didn't really understand much when I was in early, my, you know, in my early teens of, you know, why was the Constitution important? You know, that just sounded kind of boring politics. Um, what's what's the big deal? But as I studied the Book of Mormon and I studied it specifically for our day and looked for the parallels with the Book of Mormon events with our Latter Day events, I had a complete change of heart. And I went from maybe not caring that much to bleeding red, white, and blue. And considering, you know, the cause of liberty is my cause and it is the co- one of the causes of my time. Well, um, in when I was when I was growing up, um, we we ended up finally producing two documentaries on it. More documentaries will be coming in the future on what what is called the Four R Day model, prophetic parallels in the Book of Mormon. And the idea is that you know here's Mormon at the end of the Nephite civilization. The Lord showed him our day and vision. He said, Mormon, this is what's going to happen in the last days. He saw it all. You know, Moroni said, I, I I've seen your you know both Mormon and Moroni, Mormon in particular, he said, I've seen your day. I've seen you. And so then he went to his Nephite history and the Lord said, you need to create an abridged version of the Nephite history for the Latter-day Saints in the last days. For those people you just saw in vision. For those people. What do they need to know? What do they need to get through one of the darkest periods in the earth's history? So he went through the Book of Mormon history and I and believe if you look in the Book of Mormon from in chronological order, you can find every single sign of the times in order. So, for example, how does the Book of Mormon start? Well, it starts with Lehi and his family, and they are fleeing for religious freedom, and they come to the promised land, and they establish a government, a, a civilization of liberty. How does our history start? It starts in the same way. You had the pilgrims and the Puritans and the Covenanters, the Scottish Covenanters and the, and the Huguenots or the Huguenots, um, the Quakers, the Calverts. They're all experiencing this religious persecution, and they fight to get the Bible, just very similar to how Nephi fought to get the brass plates. They gave up their lives. They gave everything they had. And then they came to the promised land of America and established a land of liberty. And so I believe, history repeats itself. 
absolutely. And not just not just history. Um, there's the aspect that yes, we go through these pride cycles, but also that Mormon specifically said, "Hey, the Pilgrims and the Puritans are going to come to America. What in my history has happened that's similar to that? Joseph Smith is going to be establishing the gospel. What's similar in my history? Well, I've got." Alma organizing the church. I've got Abinadi being martyred. If you parallel Abinadi being martyred with Joseph Smith, their stories are so similar. You say this this can't be coincidence. A Mosiah, the laws of Mosiah with the U.S. Constitution. You see all of these parallels. In fact, if you go through 4th Nephi, every single line of 4th Nephi, you can parallel with the millennium. In other words, if you want to know what the millennium is going to be like, go read the Book of Mormon. If you want to know what the last days are going to be like, what's going to happen in the future, the destructions, go read the Book of Mormon. It's all in there. So some of these forgotten founding fathers and mothers, you know, um, I've I've, I've taught high school classes for a number of years now, and and I like to ask my students this. Um, I say, you know, who are America's founding fathers and their mothers? And we'll say George Washington, Thomas Jefferson. and, And while that's true, the pilgrims and the Puritan forefathers of our nation really played a very pivotal role, and I believe they've been forgotten in a large way. Um, what Some interesting things about the Pilgrims and the Puritans, especially as you're getting ready for the 4th of July here, um, is that there is a theme of Israel in America. They believed that they were Israel. When they came to, they believed that they were descendants of Israel, and they named their cities after Israelite names. They named their children after Israelite names. Some of them even had visions and dreams where they said, We believe the new Jerusalem is going to be founded here, and we are here to found the new Israel. We are here to help fulfill prophecy. And the fun thing is, um, you know, as part of the Joseph Smith Foundation, one of our volunteers actually did a research. We have a timeline that we sell, and you can trace the genealogies of the royal lines of England, Scotland, France, and you can trace them directly back to the 12 tribes of Israel. We had checked up at the genealogical library, checked by different um, individuals, um, and and it's definitely legit. And you can actually trace that there. And we actually have a documentary that just came out called Hidden Bloodlines, The Grail and the Lost Tribes in the Lands of the North, that talks a lot more about who were these people, who were these Israelites being led up there. Um, But when you study American history, you really discover this was a history of Israel coming back, Israel being restored and gathering, and the Lord preparing the land for the rest restoration of the gospel. Something that's fascinating about the early foundations of America is the Christian symbolism and the Christian mottos that are found in the early universities, including Harvard, Yale, Columbia, a lot of universities that we might not recognize today as necessarily out in the forefront for religious freedom and for and for Christianity. But that was their original foundations, and we're going to talk about that. So in case you just joined us, you're listening to Latter-day Radio here on KLO, and I'm with uh, Hannah Stoddard, and she's telling us about some of our earliest forgotten fathers, the founding fathers of this country. So, Hannah, who have we forgotten? Well, I would I would submit that we've forgotten the Puritan and the Pilgrim and the Covenanters and the Huguenots, those those men and women that came over to America and really laid the laid the foundation so that the Constitution could be brought forward, that liberty could be established, and then eventually the restoration of the gospel through Joseph Smith. Um, one of the ways that we can see their vision, you know, when they, when they came to America, they had this vision that they wanted to restore Israel, that they wanted to usher in the coming of Jesus Christ and do their part in preparing the world. And one of their And they realized how important education was. So they founded schools and universities. They founded Harvard. Harvard was established in 1636. And its motto was truth for Christ and the church, which is interesting. And their seal, the the seal showed two books facing up while one book faced down. And that symbolism meant they said, you know, reason is limited. We can study and we can reason, but it is limited. We need God's revelation. So two books facing up, one book facing down. Well, it's interesting. We Today, um, in the mid-1800s, that was changed. There was a progressive movement, and the president of Harvard changed. The motto was changed from truth for Christ and the church to truth. And the seal was changed for all the books to face up. Um, So they said, you know, we're moving away from that foundation. Um, But if we look at some of the other universities, Yale, Yale's motto is light and truth, and the logo actually has Hebrew writing that says the Urim and Thummim 
on it, which is interesting, <laughs> um, because the Yerman Thummim is something that Joseph Smith was more the one that understood what that was all about. Columbia University quoted Psalm 36, 9, in thy light shall we see light. Princeton's is under God's power, she flourishes. So you're starting to get the trend of where, what these, yeah, these founding fathers and mothers were thinking, what their goal was. Um, one of my ancestors was Thomas Mayhew, and he was he, he's my ancestor on at least two different lines, and he established, established the longest known multi-generational missionary effort among the Indians of any one family, almost in the known annals of history. Mm-hmm. And he, um, he was in Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. And you hear a lot about, oh, well, all this abuse of the Native Americans. Yes, there were Native Americans that were injured. Um, those were what I like to call the laymans and the lemuels of the colonies, right? <laughs> Just like with Lehi's family, you had Nephi and Sam, and you had layman and lemuel. It's the same thing with American history. You had, you had Nephi's and you had layman and lemuels. Um, Tam- Thomas Mayhew was definitely a Nephi. Um, he loved the Indians, and the Indians loved him. Um, he preached to the Native Americans. He was considered one of their, he, they considered him a father, a counselor, one of their sachems. Um, he mastered their language in his 80s. He was still sleeping in wigwams and traveling among the Indians. His son actually died in missionary labor. Um, in fact, there were no armed conflicts in his area for over 40 years. The Indians were warring with other people, other colonists, but in his area, no armed conflicts for over 40 years. And so I like to ask the question, why have we never heard the story? And if you study history, there was really a movement in the mid 1800s to move away, to put down this Puritan past to say, you know, let's distance ourselves from this. Um, And a lot of that was influential. Um, not Nathaniel Hawthorne was very influential with his book, The Scarlet Letter, which I've actually taught The Scarlet Letter in high school. Um, I've analyzed the book. It's not historically accurate in any in any way. Um, it's also not only that, but when you study Nathaniel Hawthorne, he he had if you study his history, he had connections with the occult. He was involved in a lot of spiritualism. Um, he also hated the Puritans. So it was his way of kind of making a statement of writing a book. He he wrote the book. He said it was a hell-fired story. Um, one of his friends wrote to him and said, you know, you like there's these demons that are working. Anyways, it's a incredible, very strange story surrounding how the Scarlet Letter came about. But um, it really did, uh, it was influential in moving us away from this foundation of saying, let's distance ourselves from these Puritans and these pilgrims. And, but the fascinating thing is when you study the original history, you discover stories of faith and stories of compassion and, and mercy, the story of how America was made great. It was made great by great men and women. Um, there's a story from John Winthrop. He um, he was one of the early governors among the Puritan colonies. And during one of the hard, long winters in Boston, um, wood was very scarce and people were really just struggling to survive. And during that time, a man came to Governor Winthrop and he gave him private information and said, you know, this so-and-so is stealing wood from your wood pile. <laughs> and so he said, and he said, oh, really? And he said, um, he said, okay, call the man to me. I'll cure him of stealing. So they bring the man up. And John Winthrop goes up to this man and he says, he says, friend, he said, I know it's a hard winter. I know that you're, I know that you're starving. I know that you need wood. He said, please provide your, use wood from my wood pile until this cold season is over. And then he turned to his friends and he was like, see, I told you I'd solve the stealing. No more stealing will go on. And so this is who that John Winthrop was. These are the kind of stories that are very common among the Puritan and the pilgrim forefathers of our nation. And I would submit that we're in a period of history today when we need to look back. We need to look back to greatness. If we want to make America great, sometimes the only way to move forward is to look back. And we need to look back to our founding moorings. There is hope there and there are answers. So if you're still in school studying history, study harder. (laughs) Study the primary sources and put God back in the picture and you'll discover a history that will just absolutely amaze you and give you strength. We'll be right back here on Latter-day Radio after these messages. (laughs) 